You're watching Bread and Roses, a weekly political social magazine that's broadcast in English and Persian via New Channel TV. Hello everyone, I'm Maram Namazi. And I'm Fari Bourspuya. We're really pleased to be back. We're sorry we took so long. Uh, we said we were going to be away for two weeks. You thought uh, you'd rest. No yeah, rest there was no rest. But we were away for a month. They just We had millions of things to do and just became impossible to have our TV program. But the good news is that we've got some fantastic interviews lined up as a result of this time we were off. And the first interview with, is with Tas Taslima Nasrin, author and women's rights activist. Yeah, she'll be speaking about women and Islam. We also will be discussing, of course, uh, these great measures for gender equality and the banning of Sharia courts in Rojava, uh, Syrian Kurdistan. Uh, Bangladeshi um, free thinkers, um, a continuation of um, their murders. We'll also be speaking about an insane fatwa on the English language. Yeah, you That's heard right. right. That's from Iran. <laughs> yes. And uh, finally, our slice of life will be a defense of refugee children by Jewish refugees who were children themselves when they fled Nazi Germany and were given a safe haven in Britain. Right. Yeah. Stay with us. In the news that passed, I suppose the most exciting news is that in the liberated uh, Kurdish area of Rojava, which is uh, part of Syrian Kurdistan, the, um, they basically brought about these amazing laws and policies in defense of gender equality. So, for example, Sharia courts have been banned. Brilliant. Didn't take long. Didn't need a lot of, uh, you know, investigation, and posturing, review, and you know, research. Nothing is very clear. Sharia <laughs> is discriminatory, banned. and is banned. you know, and um, Kurdish Rojava has banned it. Marvelous. And they've also banned forced marriages. They've banned polygamy. They've banned, um, uh, of course, violence against women. They've criminalized honor killings and crimes. Uh, child marriages, I mean, you name it. They've equality removed between men and women? Equality between men and women in testimony, in inheritance, child custody going to women until the age of 15. All of these wonderful things that are in complete contradiction to Sharia laws that we see practiced in places like Iran and Saudi Arabia and also in Britain. And I mean, this is this something that Home, home Office could, uh, you know, take notes mm. and the European countries could take note. Hmm. and learn from Kurdish liberated areas. Hmm. They are leading, the, you know, the lights of secularism and um, equality of men and women, it's shining from Kurdistan. Yeah, I guess uh, we, we can now say that uh, gender equality is not a Western concept, but it is a concept that is uh, fought for, that has been established right there in the Middle East. And, and it doesn't really need Lord Ahmed to come and review and mm, think about no, it. No, we don't need investigations, British government, and inquiries uh, that are just going to, um, you know, put little band-aids and not really solve the issue. Uh, this is not just an extremism issue, of course. It is an issue about women's rights, about yeah. human rights, about gender equality. And of course, uh, you know, this is a real issue for those of us who live in Britain. We know that there are Sharia courts right here dealing misogyny and inequality in family matters. We just had a wonderful conference on the 30th of April where Elha Mania, she is a Yemeni uh, professor who lives in Switzerland. She's just done a fantastic book on Sharia law and the implications of legal pluralism in uh, Britain. And of course, it's relevant to other countries where Sharia law is practiced. Yeah, and, and the conference looked at the implications of that and very clear evidence that is discriminatory it doesn't need too much thinking. Mm. It's very straightforward, it's very clear, it's very simple. We need to learn from history of humanity in the last couple of hundred years. Ban Sharia courts, abolish them. Full That's stop. What we need. Yeah, full stop. So we will be showing uh, the videos of the conference. So that's something that um, 
uh, his truly needs to <laughs> edit and get ready and put it online. Uh, but also, we would suggest that you buy El Hamania's book as well. It, it's brilliant. And I think what's, what she said at the conference, which I think is the key to all of this, is that forget about any theoretical discussions uh, on the place of religion in society. Forget all of that. Let's think about it as an issue of consequences. What are the real consequences on people's lives? It's very negative, to say the least. Um, and of course, we're seeing, you know, when we talk about the issue of Sharia law, I know we focus a lot on family issues, obviously, because that's where women are most discriminated against. But the criminal Hudud codes of Sharia are so brutal and barbaric, and we mustn't forget those. In Iran, in Iran there's recently, a, there's yeah. a man, they, don't, they want to, um, the Islamic government is in prison. Uh, I mean, he's been in prison for 10 years. And they've blinded them in one eye. They want to repeat it and blind them in the other eye. And, and this is by sanction of the religious government in Iran. And it's basically because he uh, blinded someone in a fight. I'm not sure what happened. And therefore, it's the eye for an eye retribution. And so he needs to be blinded in both eyes as well. Barbaric, I mean, this yes. is a 31-year-old. His name is Mojtaba Saheli. So it just goes to show how utterly insane these laws are how inhuman they are, whether it's in the family code or in the criminal code. Yeah. And of course, we have the uh, examples in Bangladesh now. We need to talk about them because we've both just signed on to a letter that was organized by the Center for Inquiry. And it's about, you know, the continuous murder of not just atheists and secularists, free thinkers, anyone who's just, you know, um, says anything that the Islamists don't like, including people who are Muslims, um, are being killed, hacked to death. And uh, the Bangladeshi government's just been excusing it, haven't they? Absolutely. And the letter, uh, and the, you know, the, the letter is directed um, at the Bangladeshi government to remind them of their responsibility and demanding that the right of the free thinkers be protected in Bangladesh and we really hold the Bangladeshi government responsible for the murder murders of the free thinkers and, and atheists in Bangladesh. And they can't get away from this. They can't blame it on the victims. They can't even say, look, we have no control of the investigating. They haven't done much. And there's and, clear evidence that they actually haven't done much. And they not only haven't done much, they are blaming the victims. So you've got the prime minister saying that people who say filthy things, that's exactly what she's called it, you know, have to be careful what they say. Uh, they ha they have to be held responsible for in inflaming people's sentiments and feelings. And, and this is about people who've just written their opinions, who are being hacked to death in broad daylight on Bangladeshi streets. So the Bangladeshi government needs to be held accountable. And we need to keep the pressure on until people are prosecuted for these crimes. And uh, free thinkers are safe uh, on the streets of, of that country. Thank you. Just recently, I was at a Rationalist International conference in Tallinn, Estonia, and there I met the wonderful Bangladeshi author, activist, um, hero for many, Taslima Nasrin. I uh, managed to uh, chat with her after the conference to talk to her about her perspective on women in Islam. You don't want to miss this interview. Tasima Nasrin, it's a great pleasure to have you on our program. I wanted to ask you about you know, your years of work. One of the main areas has been a defense of women's rights and, of course, criticism of religion. How are these two linked to each other? Yeah, you know, all religions are anti-women. So if, you, if we want to have women's rights and freedom, uh, we should fight against religious fundamentalism and also religious laws, all you know, kinds of religious systems, because women are oppressed, not only because of traditions, anti-human customs and cultures, women are oppressed because of religion. So it is, it is not possible that, uh, to get women's freedom under any religious system. So 
states must be separated from religion uh, laws should be you know without religion uh, we must have uniform civil code based on equality not based on religion you talk a lot about your personal uh, you know uh, story how it was growing up as a girl the discrimination you faced the inequality you faced and it's a effects on the work that you do today. Can you explain a little bit about that? Uh, you know, I was uh, born to a Muslim family and uh, uh, my father was a secular man, but my mother was religious. She put lots of pressure on me to, you know, read the Quran or pray. But I was a curious child. I wanted to know what's written in the Quran because the Quranic verses that I used to read, I didn't understand the meaning of those verses. So my mother never told me the meaning of those verses. So because I was a curious girl, I wanted to get the translation of the Quran. So. One day I read the translation, I found all the inequalities and injustices in the Quran and I also read the Hadith and I found that there is, you know, inequalities and injustices against women. And also I studied other religions and I found that they are oppressive uh, also to women. So I was not really a believer, but I stopped actually respecting any religion because women are human beings but all religions treated women as inferior beings uh, and I found that also religious laws that are disc uh, you know they're all religious laws either Hindu religious laws or Muslim religious laws are anti-women. There is no equality in marriage, divorce, child custody, or inheritance. Women do not get uh, equality under any, any religious system. So I am for women's rights and freedom. I fought for women's education, women's equality, and also I fight against religion. Not only, I, not only religious laws or religious, uh, um, you know, um, education, I also say against religion. Because, you know, um, we see that if you say against religious fundamentalism or religious terrorism, you would not be attacked by religious fundamentalists, but you can get ki killed or you would um, end up in prison or uh, you would be forced to leave your country if you, if you criticize religion. So I criticize religion you know, 30 years ago. So I, uh, the fundamentalists issued fatwas against me. They set price on my head. And not only in Bangladesh, where I later lived in India also, five fatwas were issued against me and I was physically attacked by fundamentalists. And I was forced to leave Bangladesh 22 years ago and also I was forced to leave West Bengal, where I where I lived and also I had to leave India. Now, uh, in 2011, I started living in India again, but you know, I would be, um, I would get, uh, you know, I, it's not a safe place for me. Uh, Hindu fundamentalists or Muslim fundamentalists can kill me any moment or I, would, I think I would be thrown out of India someday because many Hindu fundamentalists are against me. Uh, you know, if you are a feminist, 
if you are a humanist and if you are a re true secularist and atheist, it is impossible to live in Muslim countries and also it is impossible to live in a country where Muslims uh, population is quite a lot. So India is the kind of second largest, uh, India has second largest population of Muslims. So, uh, so Muslim fundamentalists already issued fatwas against me in India. And uh, Hindu fundamentalists are also very violent. You know, they have been killing rationalists in India. They have been killing innocent Muslims for eating beef. So, um, because I criticize Hinduism also, and also Hindu fundamentalism, Hindus also do not like me. You know, so you would have no place you know, anywhere, if you are a true feminist and true secularist, and if you are a feminist, you have to be secularist, you have to be an atheist. Um, there are many women who say that they believe in religion, and they are religious people, and they are feminist. I don't believe them, you know. You cannot believe in in anti-women um, religion and uh, you claim that you are a feminist. No, it's not possible. I don't know, sometimes you know some w women um, actually are fighting to get the right to go to temple, you know, uh, because some temples in India do not allow women to enter and many mosques also do not allow women to enter. But many feminist organizations are uh, fighting for the right uh, to enter mosques and temples. In way, anyway, no God is actually pro-women. So, so what is the need for women to go to those temples and mosques and worship anti-human gods? Um, but anyway, I think that uh, women should have the right to enter anywhere they want, but also they should know that no God actually favors women. All religions are anti-women, so there is no place for women in any religion. Women are treated as sex slaves. Women are treated as uh, you know slave of men. Women are treated as childbearing machines. Uh, so. Uh, you know, sometimes I understand why men worship uh, gods and why men believe in religions, because men are treated as superior beings in religion, but women are not. So, so why women uh, need to worship uh, misogynistic uh, gods? Maybe women are brainwashed for centuries that uh, they should worship God and it is good to believe in God or it is good to practice religion and so that maybe they want to be good women. You talk about uh, no country for women. I think that's such a painful image and idea. How does that make you feel? What do you mean by that? I think country means security safety and women are not safe anywhere in the world they are not safe in any country because all societies in the west or in the east in the north or in the south are patriarchal and women do not get any equality in any patriarchal society. So women are not safe anywhere. Women can be raped, can be victims of domestic violence, can be, you know, victims of sex trafficking. They can be killed only for being women. You know, men are oppressed too. Women are oppressed too. You know, 
Women are oppressed, men are oppressed too, but men are oppressed for different reasons. Women are op oppressed for those reasons too, but women are oppressed for being women. Men are not oppressed for being men. So, when I say there is no country for women, because there is no security for women. If I do not feel safe and secured in any country only because I am a woman, so I have no country. So I think that no country for women. Do you feel a, a sort of um, country or safety in your work, in the work that you do? Because I think it also gives a home to a lot of people. Yeah, yeah. When I write, when I write a good book, I feel good. And also, you know, I, mm, when I started writing against patriarchy, against misogyny, against religious fanaticism, against religion. When I was in my country, I wrote those. And then I found that I'm losing friends. I'm becoming totally alone. And people I knew started hating me. Government filed cases against me, you know, but uh, religious people or religious fundamentalists, you know, they had demonstrations against me. Hundreds of thousands of people demonstrated against me and they demanded my execution by hanging. You know, I felt that I don't belong to that society. When I lived other in other countries, in the West or in India, I felt also I don't belong to this society. And I found that the people who are secularists, humanists, feminists, you know, they love me, they respect me, they understand me, they showed their solidarity towards me, then I feel home. So actually, I don't have any home, I don't have any country, but those, the people who sympathize with me, you know, love me or respect me, that's my home. They are my home. Don't you feel like um, you've made so many sacrifices? Do you sometimes feel it's too much? No, I don't think so, because I know there are many people only because they express their views, which are different than most of the people's views, got killed. They're still in prison. You know, so I think that um, there are other people for, for expressing their different views. Uh, Maybe they haven't expressed that much, but they were killed. You know, in Bangladesh, so many atheist bloggers and writers were killed. Uh, and they didn't write many books. Maybe they didn't write at all any book. Nazimuddin Samad, a student, a law student, was killed a week, maybe two weeks ago. What did he write? He didn't even write, you know, any blog. Just he supported some of the secularists on his Facebook. So he was uh, hacked to death. So I, I don't think that I sacrificed a lot. I, okay, I was thrown out of my country 22 years ago. Since then, uh, I was not allowed to enter my country. It's very painful, but I'm lucky that I'm still alive. If I lived in my country, I would have been killed long ago. And I'm very lucky that I'm still alive, I'm still writing books, I'm still talking, 
uh, but I know that I can be, you know, killed at any moment because it's not that Bangladesh is unsafe for secularist or free thinkers. So we are seeing that other places are becoming very unsafe. India, you know that what is happening in Europe, in Paris, you know, people were killed for no fault of them, you know, and in Brussels, you know, everywhere the these Islamic terrorists, um, you know, make every place very unsafe for people. So. I don't know how long I would survive, but but uh, I will continue my writing. I will continue my uh, fight against extremism, against um, against fundamentalism, fanaticism, misogyny, and patriarchy until my death. You must be proud of your work, though, because a lot of people are so proud of your work. <laughs> Uh, it must feel good somehow, despite all of it, to know what an impact you have on, on lots of people across the world. I have many enemies, but I have some friends too. And I have some readers and they love my writings. I'm, say, I'm, I'm very grateful to them because it is not easy to get my books. You know, the government banned my books and also... People are afraid to read my books if they, if fundamentalists, uh, you know, know that they are reading my books. Maybe they will be attacked. You know, there is an organization, the Slimmer Supporters Group in Bangladesh, and uh, one man was the member of that uh, group. His name was Niloy Neil. He was a blogger too. He was brutally killed by um, Islamic terrorists. And some of the uh, members of that group actually left the country because they were also followed. They were also afraid that they would be killed by Islamists. Um, so it's so much. It is so much difficult. You know, it's difficult to get my books, but. I'm glad that many people read my books and many people get inspired by my writings. Many people became atheists and feminists and secularists and they said that they, after reading my books they became um, atheists and secularists. And also many bloggers who are atheist bloggers said that they read my books so they became atheists because they are young people. Uh, even, you know, they were very, very little when I uh, had to leave my country. Afterwards, they heard my name and collected my books and read my books. It is good that I find sometimes that I should continue doing my work. It is, uh, you know, there is no meaning of life, but maybe I can create a meaning of my life. We are all doing the same thing. Thank you. Thank you, Tasima. I hope you enjoyed that interview with Tasima Nasrin. I mean, what else can one say? It's absolutely brilliant. It's the importance of criticizing a religion, particularly when it comes to women's rights. I mean, I think women should all be atheists, really, given how much uh, gods, all gods, hate, despise women. And, and this is it. You know, <laughs> when people talk about, you know, tradition, culture, no, actually it's a religion. <laughs> religion is a source of misogyny, is a source of uh, anti-woman laws and legislation in every single society yeah. that you could see. And I think Tasnima Nasrin is right when she uh, says that all gods hate women. And they that, do. That's, they uh, do. Can I just say um, a, a little story? About 20, yeah. 20, 20 years ago, <laughs> um, I remember that when Tasnima Naslin was under threat in Bangladesh, mm -hmm. we organised a demonstration uh, in support her, in, in her support, and I still have photos of that demonstration <laughs> in front of the Bangladeshi maybe, embassy. Maybe you can show it when you were young and you I didn't mean, have as much grey hair, most probably. I know, you were not born then. <laughs> <laughs> and, not um, true. <laughs> 
<laughs> I, know, I guess um, we need to send this to Tassar and yeah, Nancy. Definitely. Maybe I just show some of those photographs. <laughs> it was a, you know, when I, every time I see Taslima Nasrin speak, I remember those mm. good old days. And so, <laughs> it, you know, it's, it's important, yes. the protests that are done, even today, in defense of Bangladeshi bloggers and yes. free thinkers. Uh, but the best thing that Taslima says is that, uh, you know, uh, for example, that suicide bombers get 72 virgins in heaven. And what does a woman get? She gets the same lousy husband. <laughs> <laughs> You know, even there, it's, it's stacked up against women. The insane fatwa of the week is from Ayatollah Khamenei in Iran, who has basically said that English is not the a language of science. Yes, uh, um, he regularly meets with various uh, group of people related to him and his little mafia. Uh, <laughs> big mafia. Big actually. mafia, little big mafia, mafia, big mafia. Huge the godfather mafia. got all the people who, who are active in the education establishments. I don't know what they do. Education. And he criticized people who are learning English. And he's actually said, that why all these young people, he's scared of course, why are all these young people learning English? The language of um, all the scientists have never historically been English. that of English. Mm. Yeah, and one of his supporters later on <laughs> actually said, you know, the language philosophy is German, well, the, the nature of English language is fraud and deception, <laughs> and nobody should learn it. And they'd be worried that even kids, everybody puts the kids in nurse, in, in, in from nursery, Everybody's teaching English. <laughs> but it's funny because there's this uh, um, Ayatollah Tanasoli, which means Ayatollah Genitalia in uh, Persian. He's got the spoof Twitter account. And he's basically said that, you know, whatever language is oh. the language of science, it doesn't matter. Uh, Islam is opposed to that. Absolutely. Period. I mean, <laughs> and, and it's interesting, uh, Khamenei and his little mafia is been... Big mafia. Little mafia. The <laughs> little, the all little. <laughs> um, they've all been ridiculed on social uh, media for <laughs> saying this and everybody's laughing at them. <laughs> they're just crazy bunches of people that so. they're scared. They're scared of people learning English. English. But there's a fatwa against a language. I mean, do you see how insane this is? pure insanity. This week's Slice of Life is from Eric Reich. He is the chairman of Kinder Transport, an association of Jewish refugees. And he's expressed concern that the David Cameron government had initially refused to allow 3,000 uh, refugees from Syria, children, to come to the UK to gain protection. And he said, as someone who was a child himself, he was four-year-old when he was uh, allowed to escape along with 100,000 others to Britain and to reach safety, he's come out in favor of defending Syrian refugees. And his, his passionate letter really shines with the uh, human feelings and those who are, uh, you know, anti-immigrant, anti-refugees, they need to learn from yeah. this gentleman. Yes, definitely. And he says it's incumbent to demonstrate our compassion and human kindness um, for those and give sanctuary for those who are in need. And I think it, it's really uh, wonderful given what he's been through himself. Uh, we were just looking at a news piece about him. He was four years old when he came here unaccompanied and uh, he never saw his parents again because they were killed uh, by um, the Nazis in Germany. And that's plight of many Syrian refugees yeah. today. And yeah. I think we need to recognize how history is looking at the plight of the Jewish refugees, mm. and people are proud of what they've done to mm. save yeah. uh, Jewish refugees. We need to do the same for the Syrian refugees and, and refugees, unaccompanied, yeah. unaccompanied And just minors. to give you some statistics about the unaccompanied minors, I mean, there's been 368,000 uh, minors who came to Europe um, uh, last year, and um, 
one fourth of them were unaccompanied without their parents. So it's uh, nearly a hundred thousand children. It's a huge number. And imagine to be without your parents. There's some documentaries I was looking at where they talk about having insomnia, waking up, uh, feeling that they've been chased, and missing, missing their families and loved ones. How hard that must be, and how important it is for us to. Um, show compassion to children. Anyway, we've reached the end of our program. We hope you enjoyed this week's program. Thank you for all your kind messages asking us where we were and why we weren't doing our programs. We're back on air. We were busy preparing a lot of things in the background. That's what sure, we're doing. Yeah, yeah, we were yeah. not just sitting idle. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's true. <laughs> so anyway, uh, keep in touch. Keep writing to us. And we look forward to seeing you again next week at the same time and same place. Until then, goodbye. Goodbye. Hi, I'm Mariam Namazi. And I'm Fadi Bospuya. We're hosting a program called Bread and Roses. It's a weekly program that's broadcast in Persian and English in the Middle East and North Africa, primarily Iran as well. And it's also shown on YouTube internationally. And we've been doing this since last May. We're coming up to a year's anniversary. And yeah. we, we've had quite a lot of fun making these videos. We discuss taboo breaking, free thinking ideas. The Islamic regime of Iran has called us immoral and corrupt and that's why the, you need to support us we are and the vo alternative voice in Middle East and North Africa of corruption and immorality so do support us here's a short video from patreon that explains how you can help us with even just one dollar a week that's nothing support us patreon lets fans become patrons of their favorite artists and content creators it's different than Kickstarter because it's not about one big project that requires lots of funding. It's more for bloggers or YouTubers or web comics, anyone who creates on a regular basis. Here's how it works. When you become a patron, you're agreeing to give an artist a tip of an amount you set every time they release a piece of content, whether it's a new song, a video, or a recipe. You can set a monthly maximum to make sure that you're always within your budget. Choose an amount, enter your payment information, and you're done. Becoming a patron allows you to view and post in the artist's stream. And in exchange for your support, artists offer additional patron packages, which might include monthly Google Hangouts, music production tutorials, pre-sale concert tickets, or anything they can offer as a way to say thanks. Patreon, empowering a new generation of content creators.